what is true? For what are we all yearning? Thank you and good morning. I'm Dick Blackford from Jonesboro, Arkansas. And we're continuing our study today on the subject of racism. We hope you have your Bible handy and also perhaps a pencil and, and piece of paper to take some notes that you might want to have. And this is a very important topic and it's very relevant. It was relevant in Bible times as well. And so we were talking about this subject uh, last week. We're going to continue today. In the Bible, we read a statement by the Apostle Peter when he went to the house of a Gentile. He said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable unto him. So with that in mind, we're going to continue some questions that we began trying to answer last week. We answered those first three, and we're going to be talking about uh, interracial marriage here in just a moment. But before we get to that, we want to talk about the question, is one race more prone toward crime than another? So let's think about that. You know, we have to be careful here. It has never been determined that skin color is what causes people to commit crime. In the USA, you know, it may seem that some crimes are more prevalent among certain races. For example, when I lived in, and we need to be careful here, we don't want to prove more than what we intend. When I lived in Memphis, Tennessee, it was known as the carjacking capital of the world. And if you were to ask somebody what race was most associated with that crime, nearly everybody would say the black race. And then again, if you were to ask people what race uh, if you mention drug dealers and, and pimps, most people would say, well, that was more associated with the black race, not to the exclusion of any other, but more with them. And the same would be said if you were, at, were to ask what race is more notorious for committing crimes against its own race. Now, at that point, it's pretty easy for white people to feel proud of themselves. But what race do we associate more with serial killers? They have predominantly been white, sorry to say. Jack the Ripper, Sam Shepard, John Wayne Gacy, Richard Speck, Theodore Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Dennis Rader, Gary Leon Ridgway, to name a few of the well-known ones. Ridgway killed over 48 women. And then when we mention school shootings, which race is most predominant? Most all of the perpetrators have been white. So just as there are many black people who would never think of carjacking or dealing drugs, there are also many white people who would never think of becoming serial killers or school shooters. You know, man is capable of horrendous evil, and skin color has never been proven to be the cause of it. You know, there have been people of all races who have grown up in cultures and environments that made it easier for them to continue to be associated with certain crimes, certain, certain wrongs. We see this in organized crime, children that grow up in that society, uh, people trying to survive poverty, uh, illegal gambling, including dog fighting and rooster fighting, drug dealing, mistreatment of women. You know, many of these are directly related to broken homes, not necessarily to race. And dysfunctional families due to an absentee father or a single mother on drugs, or when both parents are together but they're incapacitated by meth and cocaine and alcohol. You know, such children are often left to just kind of grow up on their own and do what seems necessary in order to survive. And that's often led us to associate certain crimes with certain races or cultures. However, one's environment is never an excuse for sin. You know, God's Word teaches that we can rise above our situations, whatever they are. We should never categorize or stereotype individuals because of their behavior of other people and try to say it's because of the color of their skin. You know, I think a great example of this is the story of Ruth in the Old Testament. She was left widowed by, as a young woman and left to take care of her widowed, aged mother-in-law, Naomi. That was before the days of any government programs for senior citizens, such as Social Security or disability or welfare, and uh, for other people who were down on their luck. And Ruth seemed condemned to a life of poverty. 
But I'll tell you what she did not do. She did not turn to immoral practices in order to survive. And although she grew up in an environment of paganism and all that goes with it, the immorality that accompanied, she kept God first in her life and God blessed her for it. She didn't use her environment or her poverty as an excuse to do evil. Read the book of Ruth for a heartwarming story there. You know, I remember uh, seeing a sign behind a counter in an old drugstore years ago that said, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. It's what they do after that that makes the difference. Well, a person is not born to be a racist. <clears throat> it's a learned attitude. Unfortunately, there's some people in all the races who have racial attitudes and they believe that their race is superior to all others. But now to our question, did God forbid interracial marriage? Verses used in the Vernon Barr debate, in the Barr-Evans debate, were not forbidding interracial marriage uh, based on the skin color, but on religious grounds. People of the Israelite nation were not to intermingle with the heathen nations, lest they be influenced to worship other gods, not because of their skin color, and also because God had promised Abraham that he would bring a blessing into the world through his son, uh, through one of his children, which would be Jesus. He would bless all nations. And so God did make provisions for proselytes to Judaism in the book of Exodus. And there's a, that's apparent in the case where Moses married an Ethiopian woman and uh, the Bible said Webster's second definition of the word Ethiopian, archaic, he says it's a black person. Well, Aaron, Aaron and Miriam murmured against Moses because he had married an Ethiopian. And of course she was punished with leprosy. God did not reprove Moses for marrying uh, an Ethiopian. In fact, the very context, God said that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth and his whole family, he was faithful in all of his house. I know that interracial marriage in times of segregation and while desegregation or integration is taking place can be difficult for families, mixed families especially. Husbands and wives and often their children suffer being outcast, maybe by both races. But the more things a man and woman have in common, the more likely they are to have a successful marriage. The most important thing is that they have the same respect for God and His Word, and that'll solve all kinds of problems. Applying God's Word is the greatest single thing they have going for them, and it'll contribute toward a successful marriage. So the New Testament does not regulate marriages of different races. Any attempt to argue from Scripture against interracial marriage can also be made against uh, marriages of people of other nations. That's primarily what was being forbidden in the Bible was the marriage of people of other nations uh, because of idolatry. Now, in many communities and several decades of integration since all that's passed, with the races today attending the same churches and the same schools and shopping in the same stores and eating in the same restaurants and working together in the same jobs and serving in the military together, Interracial marriage is on the increase, and especially as we see the world kind of growing smaller, as we see uh, travel between countries increasing and cultures becoming less prevalent. But we ought to offer up our prayers to God for any couple, anybody who is experiencing difficulties in today's changing times. You know, it ought to be pointed out that vast cultural differences often exist within the same race. Some who are highly educated and wealthy have little in common with those who live a life of poverty and crime in the slums, though their skin may be the same color. Here's another question we said we wanted to raise, and that is, is homosexuality to be equated with being born into a particular race? Well, the Bible, as well as experience, teaches that one has no control over the race into which he was born? Can the Ethiopian change the skin of, color of his skin or the leopard his spots? That question is raised in Jeremiah 13 and verse 23. That's a rhetorical question that expects a negative answer. It deals with that over which one has no control. Now, we have no similar question regarding the practice of sodomy. 
as though it was something over which one had no control. Nothing comes close to that. However, the homosexual movement has erroneously advocated that being homosexual is the same as being born black. I'm acquainted with many people in the black race, close friends of mine, who resent that comparison, as all thinking people should. They're not on the same basis. The men of Sodom de desired Lot's visitors. It says that we may know them carnally. Genesis 19, verse 5. Lot said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. And that practice gave birth to the word sodomy, named after Sodom. It was said to be an abomination to God. And that practice is condemned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Romans 1, verses 26 and 27. We don't have any condemnation like that of a person's skin color being born into a certain race, nor have scientists proved that a person is genetically predetermined to practice sodomy. You know, some of the Corinthians had been guilty of that sin, but the Bible says they were changed when they were washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's a reference to their baptism in Acts 2.38. Now then, let's talk for a few moments about the the Christian and collective guilt. Let's consider that. You know, Christians shouldn't have any part in any organization that promotes racism. Sometimes that includes churches. Some churches promote it, and we need to avoid that. And that happens on both sides of the racial divide. You know, if these were personal injustices by, that by present generations that were being committed, we would agree that that's wrong and that ought to be uh, corrected. However, we're talking about things that happened as much as seven generations ago. And so we raise the question, is there inherited sin, inherited guilt? The Bible says no. It says the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father the son. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. And so I'm thankful to God that I'm not guilty of what my former generations did to the Indians. Now, I don't know if any of my ancestors were involved in that. That's beside the point. But likewise, no Indian living today is responsible for what happened to former generations, then scalping many innocent men and women and children. And neither should I be pronounced guilty for the way many black people were mistreated during slavery, nor should any black person be held accountable to the way cannibals and tribesmen treated white missionaries who went to foreign lands in previous centuries. And there were also black slave traders who were capture people of other tribes and sell them into slavery. But no black person living today is responsible for that or is accountable for it. We should all deplore man's inhumanity to man. And let's equally deplore the attempt to blame people who had nothing to do with it and were not alive at that time, long before they were born. None of the people who administered or received injustices generations ago are living today. You know, God's judgment is not going to be based on collective guilt. We're not going to stand before God as a race of people. We're not going to be standing before God on the basis of our occupations. We're not going to be standing before God even as churches. We're going to stand as individuals. Each one of us is going to receive the things done in our bodies, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it's going to be on an individual basis. How I treated other person, how other, pe other people treated others as well. People of all races should abhor any injustice that were committed by previous generations. And we shouldn't uphold those. We shouldn't champion those. You know, in the 1950s and 1960s, there were many white Southern preachers who preached racist messages. In the 21st century, many predominantly black churches are preaching a racist message. Uh, we are aware of the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, of which Jeremiah was, uh, Wright was the pastor for many years. It promoted what was called a black values system. And you can see the website for that. And there are a number of predominantly black churches who support the, that view. And evidently, that was evidenced by the fact of a victory tour that was held where they visited many churches and college campuses called the Victory Tour. 
But we want to point out that racism is not unique to people of only one race. In what way can a black value system improve upon the biblical value system? That's what we need to be asking. Can they improve on the moral teaching of Jesus, of the scriptures? Can the golden rule be upgraded and made more relevant? Tell me how. I can't think of any way that can be improved on. Treat others as you would like to be treated. We sometimes paraphrase it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Luke 6 and verse 31. And then what about rendering evil for evil, but instead rendering good for evil, as Paul taught in Romans chapter 12 and verse 17? Can a black value system improve on that? I know a white value system could not improve on it. And so we need to rise above all of that and go back to the Bible and find what Jesus, Jesus is the perfect example. He dealt with everybody fairly and equally. So it's the inner man that we're talking about. Now we want to talk about some other things here. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said we're created equal. Now that doesn't mean we all have an equal amount of money in our pocket. We all live in houses that are exactly alike, uh, that every, all the food we eat, everything is equal. Here are the ways in which we are equal. First of all, God loves all of us equally. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves every one of us, red, yellow, black, or white, equally. He made the same sacrifice for all of us, and that was Jesus on the cross. He did that for everybody. We all have equal origins. We all came from Adam and Eve, and then thusly through Noah and his family. We all came from them. So we're all equal in origin. And we mentioned earlier that uh, the book of Acts and the King James Version said we're all made of one blood. What we understand from that, and if we're gonna talk about blood, uh, all of us, no matter what race, if we have the same blood type, we can exchange blood. Have you ever considered the fact that the first heart transplant that took place in Cape Town, South Africa, when Dr. Christian Bernard transplanted the heart of a black man into a white man's body? Well, what does that tell you? And we can exchange organs. We can exchange blood because we all have the same origin. We are of one blood. And then we also have an equal downfall. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's every one of us, regardless of race. We all have that downfall. Romans 3, 23, we've all sinned and the wages of sin is death. We all need a savior. We're equal there in that we all need a savior. We also are gonna have equal judgment. Each one of us is gonna stand in judgment before God based on what we have done in the body, that is in our physical body and how we treated others. You know, the judgment scene that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 25, and how, whether we visited those in prison, took care of the sick, fed those who were hungry, thirsty, and all that. He said, and as much as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye did it unto me. So we're gonna be judged on that basis, and that crosses all racial boundaries. And so we need to think less of race and more about what Jesus said. So we're gonna have equal judgment, but here's the good news. We also all have equal offers of salvation. The great commission that Jesus gave, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Mark's account says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. So every creature, all nations, that covers everybody, including the races. So there's nobody left out. Well, I wanna point out that when we talk about this, and we go back and talk about Lincoln and Darwin, I mentioned uh, last week that Lincoln and Darwin were born on the same day. Lincoln said all men are created equal, Darwin said they're not, they're our favored races. 
and that therefore, and here's the difference. Abraham Lincoln gave us the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing millions of slaves, claiming that all men are created equal in the Gettysburg Address. Darwin had got two book deals out of the thing, The Origin of the Species and The Descent of Man, and he claimed that men were not created equal, but they evolved and some were more evolved than others. He lived 17 years longer than Lincoln because Lincoln's life was cut short prematurely, primarily because he believed that all men were created equal. So think about that. You know, it's the inner man that counts. The story is told about a little black boy who uh, saw a man on the street selling balloons. And the man, as an advertising gimmick, he would release one balloon at, for, at a time and let it float up into the air and it would finally disappear in the atmosphere. And uh, he let, out, let go of a red balloon and it flew up and finally disappeared. He let go of a yellow balloon and it finally went up in the sky and disappeared. And then he released a white balloon and it went up in the sky and disappeared. And finally, the little black boy went over and had the nerve to ask the man, what would happen if you released a black balloon? The man then released a black balloon into the air and it soared upward till it could be seen no more. And the man then told the boy, it's not the color on the outside, it's the stuff inside that counts. That's the same lesson that Martin Luther King taught when he longed for the day that a man would not be judged by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. That's an important principle for us to realize and to know. So I hope we all realize that today. So it is for all of us. The inner man is what God looks at. That's what he sees. Although we often look at the outer, outer man and we judge a man based on that, judge him by looking at the cover. I think it's interesting in the Old Testament when a, a king was needed to replace King Saul and all of Jesse's sons were passed before Samuel the prophet to decide who would be the next king and none of them was it. And Samuel asked Saul, are there any others? He said, yeah, I've got a son, a boy out there in the, in the field feeding the sheep and he called for him and it was the little boy David. And David was the one God chose. And there's a statement there that ought to register in the minds of all of us. In 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, he said that God seeth not as man seeth. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So we need to see like God sees. Sometimes we proverbially say that God is colorblind. Uh, by that we mean that God ju doesn't judge people based on the color of their skin. So the Bible repeatedly tells us that there is no respect of persons with God. Romans 2, verse 11. And if we're going to be like God, we must not show respect of persons either. And that's what Peter was saying in Acts chapter 10, in verses 34 and 35, when he said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable unto him. So with that in mind, we want to point out that to become more like God, we need to see beyond the color of a person's skin. You know, it's been said that we could learn a lot from crayons. Some are sharp. Some are pretty. Some are dull. Some have weird names. All are different colors, but they all exist nicely in the very same box. Why can't we be like that today? God has set the pattern for us. He's told us everything we need to know about the subject. And we need to be content with what he has revealed. He didn't tell us for sure where the races came from. There's some things we might deduce, but he stopped short of telling us. We need to be satisfied with that. He didn't think it was important enough to answer that question in the Bible because there are other things more. He was more important about preparing us for eternity. We're going to spend eternity somewhere, and we need to be sure that we're ready for that. In the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 1, James said, My brethren, hold not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. We need to learn that lesson today, all of us, red, yellow, black, or white.
In 1 Peter 2 and verse 17, the Bible says, honor all men. That means no exclusions. We're to honor all men. Let's consider that. And there's our verse we talked about earlier, our tru of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. All of us need to learn that lesson. I do, you do, everybody that you know needs to learn that lesson. So as we think about the subject of racism, it's important. It needs to be eradicated. Whether it ever will be, I don't know. But we have the answer to it and it's found right here in the Bible, the Word of God. We just need to go to that source. This is the cure for racism, not evolution, not the theories of men, but God's Word. After all, God created us. He knew what He was doing. He still knows what He's doing. And the way the Bible reads right now is the same way it'll read tonight when you go home and go to bed, if you make it. The way the Bible reads right now is the same way it's going to read in the morning when you wake up, if you do. The way the Bible reads right now is the same way it's going to read on the Day of Judgment. And you will be there, and I will be there, and the Lord will pass judgment on us based on how we lived in this life. We're on trial right now. Sometimes people think we're going to go on trial on the Day of Judgment. No, right now is the trial. The Day of Judgment is for the Day of Sentencing. Well, I hope you've profited and benefited from our studies on the subject of racism and that you'll continue to study this and accept what the Bible teaches. We need to get over it and move on to things that are far more important. I thank you so much for listening today and last week. If there's any way we can be of assistance to you, please notify us at the address that we will be given in just a moment. And as we close out the program, we bid you a very pleasant good day and good week. to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the lord the maker of heaven and earth Praise you in this storm.